We now have, as part of the storyline as it continues, uh, a very interesting company, the Huffington Post. We have three gentlemen representing the Huffington Post who are here to talk about the importance of not just courage, but also a culture of innovation within. So would you please take a moment to help me welcome Jimmy Sonny, Travis Donovan, and wait a minute, that's not the person who's on my list, Dean Prestorius. There we go. Forgive me if I keep geeking out on this soundtrack, but that was The Cure, and I like that song. Um, awesome. So, speaking of The Cure, <laughs> how's that for a segue? A lot of people here are really looking at social media and social marketing from an awareness standpoint, a way to sort of sell or brand or move people along the funnel. But I actually really appreciate sort of the approach that you're bringing here to social media, that you're actually using it to create new types of products. And I think for everybody here, it is that sort of culture of innovation and experimentation that you have at the Huffington Post that I think a lot of us could learn from because I think it's not enough to just embrace new technology. I think there's a way to embrace new technology in a way to sort of become an adaptable business, become a more relevant business. So why don't we start with you sure. in terms of kind of explaining the idea of what a social product is and a little bit about your role uh, at, at the Huffington Post. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Jimmy Sony, I'm the managing editor. Um, my role is to kind of support the two people next to me who are geniuses <laughs> at this stuff. Um, and my presence on the stage should not be mistaken for any kind of expertise. Um, as far as social product and how we do social product development, I mean, I think there are a number of core principles that we can get into. But for us, at the, at the very base, it is about ruthless, rigorous experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, day in, day out, metrics-based testing of everything we do, and then bubbling up the best ideas and kind of spreading them out organization-wide. Um, you know, we can go into any of the details there, but that's, that, I think, is the core of what we do with social product development. All right, well, I'm going to dive in deeper into that in a minute, but Travis, what, what's your role within the organization? Uh, I'm our executive products editor, mm -hmm. so I oversee product development, but from the editorial side, and this mm -hmm. is actually something that I think is really unique and special about the Huffington Post is that our editors are our product people. Traditionally, we've never had product people. We've had our editors because th they are the product, essentially. They're the ones creating the content. They're the ones running the social accounts. Mm -hmm. So they've always been, first and foremost, our product people. Awesome. And Dean? Uh, so I'm Dean Pretorius. I'm the director of trends and social media at the Huffington Post. So essentially, uh, oversight of our accounts, uh, as well as an editorial team responsible for viral content. Uh, and one of the things I like to say is our product is our content. Uh, and that's really the first point of entry for a lot of people. So that is what has to promote our brand. Right. That's how we look at it. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of experts in the industry that really can't place enough emphasis on the importance of content in not just your marketing, but just how your organization communicates with employees, with customers, with prospective, prospective customers. So in many ways, I think businesses are becoming content producers. Some say it's this movement of brand journalism mm -hmm. uh, or, or brand, uh, brand publishing. But I think there's something more to it, right? Because certainly there's a, no shortage of businesses creating and distributing infographics out there and calling it a day in terms of the editorial calendar. But I think if, if one thing I've heard, and, I, and hopefully you've picked up on this too, it's this balance of people, it's this balance of content, but also intelligence in order to make things improve on performance. And so that is actually very, very inspiring. And I would love to hear, how do you even approach that? I mean, I know you guys use data, but I mean, what's the philosophy behind performance and how do you guys sort of get what it is you need to translate that into products? I mean, it's a great question, I think, <clears throat> to connect sort of the first thing you said and the last thing you said. A big part of it is that we hire for performance, right? So we, we put people through their paces when they interview. Um, we had one candidate a few weeks ago. 
I think she must have done like 15 sessions with over three days with different people and not sessions where we're asking her, you know, what was the time in your life when you've overcome difficulty? But we had her huddle around a laptop screen with us, explore the sites that she likes, give us a sense of what she's reading and how she's getting her news. That, that kind of interviewing sort of selects for performance in, it, in its own way, right? Because what we get are people who are very hungry about the Huffington Post, are very webby, are very social media savvy. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that even at other organizations and institutions where, where I've been, like I've seen that sort of pre, that pre performance and that kind of dedication is a prerequisite to actually joining the organization. That's one way that we select for performance. It, Travis, one of the things you mentioned backstage is sort of it's embedded in the culture of how you hire. I, I'm, let me know if you've heard this one before, but recently uh, there was a quite famous blog post that made its rounds on the social web about how businesses uh, in order to survive, need to hire uh, college grads to lead social media. Certainly that caused a great debate as to whether or not college grads had the business acumen, if you will, to sort of embrace this in a very mature and responsible way. Uh, the debate fell on both sides, of course. But how does that sort of affect your hiring practice? What's your philosophy on it? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's worth pointing out that a lot of the people we hire are fresh out of college or in their early to mid-20s. I mean, you're talking to three guys in their mid-20s right now who work in high positions at this And I company. don't it's, look any older than they do, right? <laughs> uh, sure. It's, you know, I think it's, it's a testament to the company. It's a testament to, to Ariana Huffington and what she's built and that she's able to put a lot of trust in young people if they prove themselves, basically, right. if they show that they know their stuff. And so a lot of the people that are coming uh, in through the door, a lot of our new hires, we don't have to teach them social. It's something that they've been growing up with. It's something that they do inherently. They understand how to interact with people on the social web. So what we do is we find those people who already understand these platforms. They know how to use them. And then we take it to the next level from there. Yeah, but what does that look like, right? So there's still the element of experience and business acumen and how do you take what is inherent in terms of digital DNA and apply that to performance where the Huffington Post is not just getting great views or creating new products, but it's actually outperforming other media properties. Yeah, well, a lot of it is looking at how they use their own personal social accounts. We'll give you a hint, I think, as to how these people will perform uh, with your brand, right? right. Um, but that's, that won't take you all the way there. I mean, you can have somebody who doesn't even use their personal social account and right. understands how to use this for a brand. I, uh, I also want to add, I think <clears throat> part, of what, um, part of what makes this space so different from others is experience is overrated, uh -huh. right? Like we hire people who have all kinds of backgrounds. What we're looking for is an essential sort of web savviness or at least an interest in learning. And the other is, um, at least some ability to tell a story, because that storytelling ability is as you know it, it's 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 true. It was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today that what is going to go viral are ultimately going to be stories that arouse some kind of emotion, right? right? Uh, so if you have those two prerequisites, like, we can really teach you the rest. But it's it's some of that sort of we 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 want what we can't teach, and then we can teach what you don't have. Right. Um, and that's, that's the thing that we're looking for, is that ability to tell stories. And as brands and people in this room are thinking about it, I mean, that's the sort of essential ingredient. Virality has a, it is part art, but there is a lot of science to it. And that science revolves around kind of what gets people angry, what gets people motivated, what gets people inspired. Um, the things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis that do very well are stories of that sort. Well, I, there's something that brands, I think, can take, take all the way to the bank, is literally that this is about storytelling. And a lot of times, businesses in, in, get caught up in sort of what the message is and what is the language of the company and how they communicate that message. Coca-Cola was on stage earlier, and they talked about sort of this idea of liquid and linked, where the content is created to have cultural relevance in whatever social network or however it travels across the social web. But you said something very interesting that I want to bring, bring back to around the idea of emotion, but understanding how to trigger the type of emotion that you're looking for uh, in order to trigger the desired outcome you're hoping to measure. So I got to imagine data plays a role in that. So how do you guys embrace data, and how do you turn that data into actionable insights? I got I to gotta say one thing that Jimmy was touching on that we didn't get to entirely is the willingness to experiment, and mm -hmm. that's where data comes into play. 
we can constantly experiment uh, and play with the data that comes out of that. I mean, we're always looking, uh, you know, as a media company, we're always looking for our traffic sources, how things are performing on social networks. Uh, putting that all together and seeing what experiments have worked and what experiments have failed. One of the beauties of social media is that everything lasts five minutes. We can iterate <laughs> very quickly and experiment almost as fast as, uh, as we can think about it. Um, you know, there are pitfalls. We can screw up very easily, uh, very quickly at the same time as we can succeed quickly. Um, there are, you know, it's finding that middle ground and using the data to decide, you know, how much benefit did we get out of doing something? Did it hurt us? Was it, was it positive? And then how much traffic did we get at the end of the day? In, I mean, you used to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the kind of actionable intelligence that you can get within a day's worth of work now, right? You can take a message and see how it plays almost instantaneously. Uh, it's, it's a great gift, I think, to be able to do that. As far as how we use data, there's virtually not a second that goes by that we're not kind of looking at a dashboard or looking at some kind of statistic. Um, to some extent, I think over time, you develop a finger feel for what's going to do well and what's not. But we have kind of dashboards galore that we've built to help us in that process. Right. Um, the important thing, though, is they are not, the important thing to remember for everybody here is it's not, data is not an end in itself, right? What we are doing day to day is uh, asking hard questions, helping our editors ask questions, and then making sure that they're focused on the right numbers. Because you can get to a place where you're just drowning in a sea of numbers and statistics and facts and figures. But what we try to do is kind of use that to say, OK, this made sense. Maybe this didn't make sense. Let's move in this direction and see what happens. All right, so let's, let's apply that to, say, the traditional business environment. Because what you just described is this idea of having um, an internal research department who would then feed that data and, and translate that data and the insights to respective business units across the organization. Here's how this performed, and here's, uh, here's what to think about in the future, or even if they get that far. But you've talked sort of about this idea of a real-time analytics engine that's pushing insights into products almost immediately. So in, in many ways, you've sort of taken this concept of a research department and turned it into uh, like an innovation lab. Almost, almost good. It, it's worth pointing out that it, while, yes, we are a media company, second to that, we've always been a technology company. Uh, almost all of our products, almost all of our technology is proprietary at this point. We have a really robust analytics system that we built that's giving this real-time data to our editors. There is no middleman. There's nobody who has to, to filter that, who has to translate it, who has to make it actionable for them because we built that into the product itself. Right. So let's There's, sorry, one more thing on this point, which is <clears throat> I don't mean to suggest that this group or the people who pay attention to data are segregated from the people who work on product. In right. fact, I mean quite the opposite. So one of the things that we try to do, Huff, the entire culture of Huffington Post, our editors are looking at data every day. We don't want this to be some function that's performed by somebody who's on the sixth floor or we're on the fifth floor. Right? The idea is that these people all pay attention to data, that product owners care about data, that they care about data that comes from social media, because it's just about the quickest turnaround time that they're going to get. Right? And the reason I say that is because let, let, let's, let's use your example of having this hypothetical data and analytics group. Let's say you post something on Facebook, and the campaign or whatever it is that you're doing gets 300 comments. That's a phenomenal number, 300 comments. What if there are 300 negative comments? Right. Right? So it's, it's actually much more about getting product owners to pay attention to that mm -hmm. rather than having data come in as a sort of flash in the pan instance of like somebody hands you a PowerPoint deck and you learn something. Right. It's really about paying attention both to the quantitative and qualitative aspects sure. of the information you're getting back. You know, Dean, you mentioned the idea of having this culture of experimentation uh, within the Huffington Post. That most, I don't know about you, but most of the businesses I deal with are a little bit more risk averse. Uh, the idea of experimentation or to fail fast, fail first, learn. These are things that are completely foreign to a lot of organizations. And there is a sense of, uh, I've, I've been in companies where you know, if, if you fail, you're fired. You, know, you, you can't not fail. So obviously, this is part of the culture of Huffington Post. But people then take that data and do something with it. I would love to hear sort of how on the other side, your editors, for example, how are they taking this and applying it to what it is that they create? And how are they sort of measured for success? Because that's got to be part of performance as well, not just how well it performed on the outside, but how well these individuals are performing on the inside. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing to keep in mind is we do look at all of our editors individually. You know, nobody's, nobody's being grouped into a large batch just solely based on traffic or something like that. Especially with editorial, there's always uh, qualitative things that you have to take into account. 
Um, as far as the culture of experimentation, it's not necessarily that we just put everything out on Facebook, that we just do like that. Um, the bigger thing is everything within the Huffington Post is a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing happens independently. Nobody is, uh, you know, nobody's going rogue. Uh, everybody is constantly floating ideas amongst each other, and that's kind of how you arrive at this place where everybody's comfortable with what happens. We're taking responsibility as a group for innovating as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, that's not, you know, that can't be done in every single instance. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing is taking as many factors as we can into account before we, before we make a decision. I think the other part of it is we just, like, we're a very flat organization, and that's, that's probably tough <clears throat> for a lot of the people in this room to kind of create. But even within your departments and your respective subgroups, you can create a kind of flatness, right, where ideas bubble up from the very bottom much more quickly. Every week, just about every week, we do these quick half-hour calls with the junior most editors, on, and we only select two or three of them every week. And essentially, the, the, the title of the call is actually called, What Can You Do Better? Like, it's, it's literally everything from like a product idea that you've had that you've been sitting on to something that you noticed in our, our content management system, our CMS, that could be improved or sped up. And every week, I, without question, we get a dozen ideas that are then submitted into a product intake process. Like, and we're asking people who maybe have been with the Huffington Post for you know, six months to a year, um, who may have only absorbed a, a, some fraction of the culture and of the ethos of the place, but we trust that they know enough to help us get better. Right. And we're asking, we're very actively asking them, how do you do that? Um, that is one way, one specific way in which we kind of encourage a culture of innovation. And on that note too, not just people who've been there for a while, but you, you can't discount the people who've just started. In fact, sometimes they have the most valuable insight. Right. Don't be afraid to ask that intern who just started two weeks ago everything they think about what you're doing. You might end up coming out of there with a million dollar idea, right? Right. So, so what, what does that intake process look like? I guess it's a formal process that I, I, I would imagine every, every business here right it's now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, look, so we've grown, right? The Huffington Post has expanded a lot in a year. And as you expand, you need to build smarter processes in place to actually manage the flow of crazy ideas that come your way. So what we do is every Monday, you know, we've taken a week's worth of ideas that have been submitted to this product intake kind of list. And we essentially sort of separate the good from the bad, and we separate the high priority from the low priority. You know, we're, we're in a business that we're, we're literally you know, fighting for inches every day. Uh, and so for us, every idea is not going to be equally valuable. There's going to be some that are better, some that are more urgent, some that are more important. So it's just very simply a way of, for us of cataloging all of the great stuff that our editors are dreaming up. We just want to make sure we're approaching all that in a smart way. And when I pointed out earlier that our editors are our product people, it's worth mentioning too that across the board, across the entire organization, we don't believe in silos whatsoever. If you go into our newsroom, you'll see our developers and our designers sitting right there next to our editors. That's how the Huffington Post has always been. It cultivates this environment where people can throw ideas off each other, where a developer doesn't have to be afraid to say, hey, why don't we file this story? He can play editor for a day where an editor can play developer for a day, et cetera. And sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable to not have those traditional barriers between groups, but it, it really makes for a lot more rewarding ideas in the end. Absolutely. Yeah, and Travis, Travis, uh, Travis and I were there before the merger uh, with AOL, and it's, this is definitely something we took away from the startup culture, you know, um, where everybody can play a different role and really work into what, they're, what they want to do uh, on a different day. Obviously, as Jimmy said, as we've grown, as we've scaled, it's a, it's a interesting problem to have, um, but it always goes back to, you know, getting to our roots and saying, you know, you have a good idea, let's try and move this to the right people and, and get it going. Yeah. Yeah. Like you'll, you'll have, and this is I, th I think something that you'll see in very few other media and journalism organizations, or journalism organizations rather, which is I will have editors send me photoshopped examples of things they want changed on the site because they just got so frustrated that they had to go out and learn Photoshop to create a mock that they could send to me that they want changed, right? There was no product person that they called to make the mock. They just got up and did it themselves. Uh, and you know, obviously it's refined over time, but you get the idea that there is this culture of being very aggressive about change, both that, that for, for people who are traditional journalists, that the words on the page are not the last thing that they care about, that they also care about the page itself, the design, the way they input data, the way they input things into the CMS. All of that matters. And to some extent, you know, that's the kind of culture that we're trying to create. I think with the last few seconds that we have left, 
one of the things that's really resonating with me is the idea of becoming a tech company. I mean, at the end of the day, I think many businesses here have to look at what that means to them, how they can embrace technology, how they can embrace innovation in order to innovate. And I think you said it best is that in order to create a sense of urgency, you have to act like there is a sense of urgency. So I think the uh, starting, uh, treating your business like a startup or acting like a startup is something that we all could benefit from. So guys, thank you so much for joining us here at Pivot. Best of luck to you. Thanks for having Cheers, me. Guys.